When the book Blue Like Jazz was initially making its rounds through religious circles, one of the hot topics of conversation had to do with cultural taboos. Namely, there was a pastor in the book who cussed, and drinking, specifically drinking alcohol, was somewhat normalized. Now, as someone who grew up around people who both cussed and drank, I wasn't scandalized at all by the stories in the book. But a lot of folks were, or at least seemed to be. And a lot of that scandalization seemed a tad fearful. No, not all of it, just there was a measure of care at times, a desire to protect people from things that might, for one reason or another, hurt them or cost them. Like, there's no question that in the case of alcohol, there are reasons for caution. And communicating that caution without being condemning or overly judgmental can be a bit tricky, which is why I really prefer hearing caretakers approach issues like booze or cussing or tattoos or sex by saying things like, I'm not comfortable here or I'm not comfortable with this and having thought a lot about it, here are my reasons. Rather than saying things like, it's gross and it's wrong, period. First, because <laughs> there are some things that are flat out just plain wrong. And the toxicity and seriousness of those things is lessened when they're treated with the same weight and the same veracity as something like foul language or horror films. But also because it's just better leadership. Saying, this is the way I'm going because based on the information I have, it's a good way for me to go and I wonder if it might be a better way for you is a thing I can respect and even follow. Especially if it's handed to me as a way of care. It's also, for the record, what I think is what we mean most of the time. But saying, I've discovered or seen a cosmic and unmovable truth that you have not seen about this very particular and sometimes very small thing, and you should get on board. That's just harder to swallow. And it's dripping with fear. Fear of the thing itself, and worse than that, fear that I'll choose poorly and unwisely given the chance. Fear makes bad religion and really unhealthy relationships. Fear also corrupts and undoes good religion and healthy relationships. Fear is also what makes a thing taboo. See, fear isn't a bad thing at all. It just shouldn't lead. In the same way, in the theme of this podcast, fear can be helpful in navigating turbulent or unclear waters, but it is a mistake to allow fear to fundamentally define water as dangerous. Sometimes there really are things in the water that should be avoided, culturally, relationally, but sometimes, <laughs> perhaps most often, it's not that the water is intrinsically problematic, it's that I'm just not a strong enough captain to do this bit of navigation. That can be harder to say but it's more humanly true and it's more caring. I would like fear to play its part in my life, keeping me from things that would undo me, keeping me from things in the waters around me that can legitimately harm me, but only in the context of a more courageous and loving navigation of those waters. If you are a regular listener, I'm assuming that that's what you want to. In the park near my house is a series of trails that intersect a small creek in a few spots, and in the winter, that creek rises and it's almost impossible to cross at one location. So a few years ago, someone built a bridge over that spot. They saw a problem and they created a solution in order to address it. Then a week or so later, someone else tore it down. And then in response, the original builder took some of the broken pieces from the first bridge and used them to assemble a new bridge. And I think that's actually how life works and moves forward, which is why I wrote that story into my next book entitled, It Is What You Make Of It. 15 stories that push back against the kind of it is what it is thinking that keeps us from entering into the world around us and living fully. The book comes out on June 1st. 
You can pre-order it now. I hope you do.